Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying K Sales uh, 2021. Uh, this is second keynote lecture. I am Professor Yun Seok uh, Lee, uh, colorectal surgeon, uh, Seoul St. Mary's Hospital, the Catholic University of Korea. I happily introduce Professor uh, Andrea Piatri Bissa, president of EAES. Uh, Professor Andrea received his medical degree in Pisa, uh, Italy in 19, 1984, and has trained at University of Pisa. And he was research fellow at the University of Chicago uh, from 1960, 1986 to 1989. He is a professor at the University of Pisa and director of general surgery and head of the Department of Oncology and also president of European Association of Endoscopic Surgeons. He was also author of 170 peer-reviewed articles, and he is also an honor honorable member of Care Cells. Professor Andrea, please. Good afternoon. It is a true privilege once more to be able to contribute to the K Cells annual meeting as president of the European Association for Endoscopic Surgery. It has been a very tough year indeed. Post-COVID world, hopefully very soon, is inevitable, but how we shape it is not. And perhaps we can avoid the hit of some future global challenge. This is a moment when we can take a breath and look into the distance to imagine what the world of surgery will look like in the coming years and how we want to shape our future. It's time for surgeons to take action and adopt new strategies. Let me share my screen with you. So today I would like to draw your attention towards some ethical obligations for the post-COVID world. Number one, the issue of global surgery. And number two, the need for our operatory rooms to take a green shift. The blue marble is an image of the Earth taken on December the 7th, 1972 by the crew of the Apollo 17 spacecraft on its way to the Moon. It is one of the most reproductive photographs in history. Looking at this picture for the first time, people knew how the Earth was like and where we all are living, a beautiful blue marble spinning in a black sky. What soon became the most popular picture of the Apollo missions was not a view of the moon, but a view of the Earth. We had to go to the moon to understand the beauty of our home planet, so fragile and isolated in space. Eugene Cernan, commander of the Apollo 17 mission, and the last man to walk on the moon said about this picture. This change in perspective, our ability to step back that far from the Earth, reprioritize how we feel about the planet and what is really important for mankind and its survival. The blue marble communicates the sense that the Earth is an island and this is all we have got. There's no backup. So the question is, today, 50 years from the first man on the moon, are we as surgical community happy about what has been achieved from a global perspective in surgery? Indeed, during the last 50 years, we made significant progress in almost every aspect of human condition. Before this pandemic, we live longer better, healthier lives in a, in a safer, smarter and more connected world. Remarkable gains have also been made in healthcare, including surgery. A disruptive revolution has occurred with the advent of laparoscopy and then of robotic surgery. With new avenues possibly opening tomorrow with the promise brought up by artificial intelligence. But progress has not been uniform. 
mortality and morbidity from conditions needing surgery very common, such as appendicitis, hernia, bone fractures, obstructive labor and breast and cervical cancers, and have constantly grown in the world's poorest regions. This woman was named a Time Magazine Person of the Year in 2014 for her frontline work fighting Ebola in West Africa. She was one of the few Ebola survivors and dedicated a subsequent life to the care of infected people. What is less known is that she died two years ago from minor childbirth complications in Liberia because no surgery was available. So the message is, in some places you can survive a deadly viral infection and then die of a minor gynecological complication the next day. More than 250,000 women in low and middle income countries still die every year in childbirth and millions more suffer from vesicovaginal fistulas resulting from prolonged labor. The urgent need for surgical care in the world's poorest region is still widely unrecognized. Today, one third of all death worldwide comes from conditions needing surgical care, which are potentially preventable. If we only consider the death resulting from trauma, this figure will surpass the number of death from HIV, tuberculosis and malaria altogether. I'm grateful to Dr. John Mira for kindly allowing me to present in this talk some of the data and messages developed within the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, established in 2014. The Commission brought together an international team of 25 commissioners, supported by advisors in more than 100 countries, and addresses the problem of global surgery. The vision of the Lancet Commission is universal access to safe, affordable surgical and anesthesia care when needed. The Commission delivered five key messages after collecting data on the current situation about global surgery. This is message number one. Five billion people lack access to safe and affordable surgical care when anesthesia and anesthesia uh, when needed. Uh, Children, elderly, disabled and female carry the highest burden of this problem. In red in this slide is bad news. The darker red the color, the closer in those countries are they to 100% of the population that doesn't really have the same kind of access to, that you and I have to a safe and affordable healthcare system. This is another component of access to surgery, SAO providers density, surgical anesthesia and uh, obstetrician providers per 100,000 uh, people. So this uh, slide uh, addressed the question how many doctors are needed. And so this is 10, uh, 20, 30 and so on per any mix uh, on 1,000, on, on 100,000. And these are data from the World Bank. It is about maternal mortality, but it could be about mortality rate from acute appendicitis, if you wish. Now, below 20 SAO, something is going on that is far from any desirable standard. Taking about, talking about targets, it has to be above 20. At the same time, we probably do not need more than 40. And how many procedures are needed per 100,000 population. If you project these numbers on maternal mortality or life expectancy or any other healthcare indicator, the pattern doesn't change. Over 5,000 procedures per 100,000 population will reach a plateau. Having more than 5,000 procedure or more than 40 uh, SAOs providers does not necessarily produce a better healthcare. In the world, we do about 330 million procedures a year. And the Lancet Commission has estimated that to meet some kind of basic needs for the people, we need 143 million more procedures. 
The reason is that one third of the world population receives only 6% of global health care. And what type of hospitals are needed? District hospitals that can do these three basic procedures, a cesarean delivery, treatment of an open fracture and laparotomy, look like, look like real hospitals and is likely to do a broader range of procedures. It's a reliable indicator of efficiency of a district hospital. Now, 33 million people experience catastrophic expenditure accessing surgical care and anesthesia each year from the direct health cost alone. An additional 48 million suffer catastrophic expenditure from no medical cost of seeking care, like traveling to the facility, loss of work, and so on. So when you think of 81 million people, that's about the population of Germany that every year is plunged into poverty, having to seek for surgical care. That should not come as a surprise if you consider that half of the world live, lives on less than $550 a day. Now, the estimated cost to support a global improvement in surgical care to meet the indicators is of about $350 billion. This might seem an extraordinary amount of money, but put this into the context that toward GDP is $70 trillion per year and the US defense budget is of $500 billion a year and $12.3 trillion is the total loss of GDP between 2015 and 2030 due to a lack of surgery when needed. In other words, investing in surgery is affordable and should be seen as a pro-growth measure. There's a proven positive economic effect in investing in surgery and health care. Finally, the Commission is not advocating surgery versus malaria or maternal care. Uh, a, the, uh, it doesn't make sense to provide uh, antiretroviral drugs to fight HIV infection if the patient is going to die of perforated appendix the next day. Healthcare has to be seen as a whole. These are the indicators of quality surgical care that the Commission came up with. Two have to do with uh, financial risk protection. It is important to control these indicators because you might be able to scale up the quality of healthcare, but at the same time get the opposite effect because less people will have access to a more expensive system. Now, uh, what can be done uh, to solve this problem? Well, problems are clear, solutions are not yet, but I think there is an ethical obligation for each surgeon and for surgical societies to join together in a common effort and try to take the challenge and try to be the change for what's very still very wrong around the world about the uh, uh, disparities in surgical care. Now, the second topic I would like to touch today is going green in your OR. Now, going green in your hospital is a win-win situation. It makes good financial sense for hospital to go green and it's an ethical responsibility for surgeons to acknowledge the need, the need now for this cultural transformation. We, we all know that over the past decades, hospitals administration have largely focused and implemented business models with great attention to cost effectiveness. Is there an extra charge if we also pay attention to sustainability or at the opposite? Will that open new opportunities for cost containment? The healthcare sector accounts for 8% of the world's total greenhouse gas emission. Each single surgical patient in our world produces an average of 5 kilos a day of biohazard waste. Hospitals are by far the largest contributors of carbon emissions, so that the greener healthcare delivery 
will have a large positive impact on our environment. On top of that, my hospital currently pays 2 euros for the disposal of each kilogram of hospital waste. 80% of all hospital waste is comparable to domestic waste and much of this has the potential to be recycled. In the OR, up to 80% of this general waste is misclassified as biohazard waste, resulting in suboptical recycling and costs of up to 20 times higher to treat and dispose of the waste appropriately. So, what can we do to approach this huge problem? The five pillars defined by the WHO for a sustainable life cycle of disposable items and devices are reduce, re reuse, recycle, rethink and research. And surgeons are key positioned to be proactive in triggering this change and engaging other players into this cultural transformation. So if you want to start doing something tomorrow, the most important step up to, to be undertaken is the creation of your own green team. The OR Green Team is a collaborative supporting network throughout your organization that involves surgeons, anesthetists, scrubs and, circ and circulating nurses, residents, clinical engineering and um, administrative staff. It will provide hospital executives and clinicians with measurable results by circulating periodical reports on the achieved targets. Surgeon leaders can accelerate the cultural change needed to encourage and sustain green practices at their institution. We must enforce the correct behavior in the use of waste bins. This action might face regulatory obstacles in some countries, like mine, where any waste generated in the OR is labeled as hazardous and therefore must be disposed accordingly and incinerated. A smart way to overcome this problem is to educate OR personnel on proper disposal of biohazard waste versus general waste by modifying the flow of waste production. In fact, general waste can undergo a process of sorting and potential, potential recycling by introducing waste segregation before the patient enters the OR. This process will apply to all packaging materials coming from surgeons and the anesthetists, rigid plastic tray, paper covering strips and particularly to blue wrapping. That altogether accounts for up to 70% of potential recyclable waste. This should be labeled as pre-incision waste, indicating that it's free from biocontamination. Blue wrapping are the most precious material out of all recyclable OR waste. They are made of polypropylene and uh, its life cycle can be very long and useful. And these are some familiar items that can be produced from recycled OR blue wraps blue beans, OR scraps, plastic bags, and wash basins. T-shirts, shopping bags, and even handmade mats to be given to the homeless are examples of common items that can be produced from blue wraps. An OR green team should also consider optimizing the use of disposable devices by standardizing operative packs and substituting single-use devices with, with reusable ones, if that does, does, doesn't affect the patient's safety. Single-use device recycling does not mean reprocessing and re-sterilizing a used disposable medical device. That is not possible in most European countries. Instead, hospital and single-use device producers can partner in a process of hospital sorting and subsequent disassembling of the medical item into its small components, plastic and metals, each to be forwarded towards a second life. Significant cost saving can derive from this practice, and several major players in the single-use device market are now paying at increasing attention to environmental issues. 
EAS and its sister societies like ACELS can and should do their best to engage with our industrial partners to encourage a joint effort into this direction. Significant cost saving can derive from this practice and several major players in the, in the single use device market are now paying increasing attention to this issue. In conclusion, we need to build a culture of respect for the environment in the OR and to partner with producers of medical devices. I call on everyone to work together to protect the nature that supports us all. The stronger our, our planet's life support system are, the better human health and wealth will be. To deal with these problems, we need a cultural transformation, and I trust that together, surgeons and our residents can take this challenge and make the world a better place to live. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Um, thank you, Professor Andrea Pietra Bissa. Uh, it was very interesting uh, talk. I never thought about uh, this kind of environmental thing before. Unfortunately, the Professor Andrea is not available online, so I hope um, uh, I'd like to close this session. Um, stay tuned and enjoy the remaining program of KSL's 2021. Thank you very much.